let's charge the damn mound. And Danny, I want to start with your off-season thoughts and really anything that stood out to you or on the trade front, anything that you're waiting to see or kind of checking your phone most frequently for. Well, not that I'm trying to check my phone frequently for this, but I just for some reason get notifications about the Reds talking about some of the things that they're planning or, or talking about, any kind of rumors. And this Jonathan India thing, man, they, they've been talking about it for so long. I know there was talks during the season uh, when they brought up uh, Ellie De La Cruz and uh, Matt McClain that there was a possible, you know, possibility of some trades. And they love this guy in Cincinnati. He's a, a great for the clubhouse, the fan base. They love this dude. But it's almost like he's he is going to be the odd man out. Like, where do you put him? Because of the the youth with De La Cruz and McLean. McLean's a stud, by the way. I, I think he's the best out of all of them, uh, the most consistent, anyways. Um, and, and Noel v, Noel V Marte, like that's another guy who's uh, came up and and did great. And listen, I love Jonathan India. I, I think he's one of the one of the better up and coming players in Major League Baseball, but. He's going to be ex more expensive soon when he hits arbitration. Uh, and the Reds just have that history of, you know, unfortunately not being able to keep a lot of their players because of a, a smaller market. Um, but when you have De La Cruz and, and Marte and McLean uh, and Carnacion, Strand, Spencer Steer, all these young guys, there's really nowhere else for Jonathan India to go unless, you know, he decides to play outfield, uh, which I bet he could. But I, I just think, this is an interesting story for, for Reds fans. Where is he going to be? Is he going to be in spring training with the Reds or, or somewhere else? Yeah, it's a good call. And I think it's probably going to happen. It's easier to do this, correct me if I'm wrong, in the offseason. Because when this conversation popped up during the year and guys are together and he is one of the leaders of the team, if not the emotional leader of the team and in the clubhouse – when you take that away from a team during the season, it burns more. It leads to more media scrutiny or conversation. At least it can become somewhat of a distraction when you lose a player like that. And it's not like the end of the roster guy either. This is a guy who deserves to be starting on a team every day. Mm -hmm. So it's one thing if a team has a guy who's at the end of their roster, right? Maybe it's a third string catcher or you know yeah. just a guy at the end of their bench that gets cut or gets traded, it happens. Mm -hmm. And still people get upset. I mean, I'm trying to think because there's there's multiple examples, but it's like a, I don't know, like a Johnny Gomes at the end of his career or or AJ Ellis when he was catching yeah. Clayton yeah. Kershaw and there were tears and the whole thing. You know, right. players like that or at the end of the bench, like that's not Jonathan India. So you can imagine yeah. what the impact would have been if say they traded him this past season, which mm -hmm. I think it was smart that they didn't, they made a mistake yeah. by not going after pitching, which hurt them. And I think they could have been in the playoffs, but yeah. that's another story. So if they're going to make a move, Danny, I think the time to do it is in the off season, which is why I think it's almost a lock that he is going to be with a new ball club for next year. Yeah. That's a great point about doing it during the off season. I, I remember when they talked about it right around the trade deadline and, and he was dealing with some injuries a little bit. So that kind of uh, put a damper into the talks, but not only in that clubhouse did it like stir up some uh, some noise, but the fans did not like that. You heard a lot from the fans, um, and, and and Reds fans are so diehard, dude. They're they're so into their team. They just want a winning team. And to hear the thoughts of Jonathan India um, getting traded during the season was was a gut punch to them. But yeah, if you do it during an off season, it's going to sting the fans for a little bit. But by the time spring training comes around, everybody's going to be excited about spring training. They're not going to say. I can't believe you did that. You know, you traded Jonathan India. So it's, it's a different time um, to, to be able to do it during the off season. I think that's a great call. Also the Reds need pitching. They need starting mm -hmm. pitching. They ran out of pitching towards the end of last year. They either had injuries or young guys who ran out of gas, mm -hmm. right? They ended up calling up quite a few players that contributed. Andrew Abbott stood out from that bunch, but he kind of ran out of steam towards the end of the year. They were banking on Lodolo coming back, Nick Lodolo at mm -hmm. some point. And ended up not being the case. Hunter yeah. Green did come back eventually for them. But, I mean, if I'm a Reds fan, I had a fun year watching a team outperform expectations. But mm -hmm. <laughs> there was more. There was more there. Yeah. They could have been a playoff team. They were yeah. close enough. And they missed the boat by not doing anything. That is a big issue. Because, I mean, Nick Crawl, who is in charge of the front office there, even 
hinted at the fact that this team was performing well. People were showing up at the ballpark. They were going to do something. And mm-hmm. I get it. It was not the world's best trade deadline. But, Danny, it was a bad trade deadline for position players. For pitchers, yeah. it was okay. It wasn't, it wasn't great by any means. Yeah. I would say it was maybe a 5 out of 10. And for position players, it was probably a 1. It was maybe the worst position player crop of availability at a trade deadline that I can remember. But the Reds didn't necessarily need to go get bats. They needed run prevention, which they tried to do with that waiver deadline where they picked up who Renfro and Bader, who yeah. neither lasted on the roster. But right. it was pitching. They needed arms. They needed they needed innings. And they yeah. just did not go out and get it. And they could have. Mm-hmm. The, well, I think uh, people wanted them to go out and get a big-name starter or – you know, somebody that has proven themselves, but I don't even think they needed that. They just needed somebody to give innings to take, take some of this, this heat off the young guys uh, that you mentioned out there. Um, you know, Hunter Green came back and, and threw the wall pretty well, but they're so protective of him. Andrew Abbott just kind of gassed out. They needed kind of a veteran guy and, and not somebody that's a 20 game winner, you know, um, Lance Lynn, I know we're going to talk about him probably at some point. He was, I think he would have been a perfect guy. Well, the Dodgers go out and get him and he gives them some decent innings out there. Uh, that's what the Reds needed. Decent innings from, from a veteran guy in that rotation, but they just weren't able to go out and get it. No. So we'll see if they do that in the off season here and pick up some pitching. Okay. So one more trade thought for you. Where do you think Juan Soto is going to end up? And the answer could be San Diego, but yeah, everybody seems to be saying the Padres are going to cut payroll. Oh, they spent too much. They can't sustain this. Okay, if that's the case, Soto is the, quote, easiest option because he's going to be a free agent after this season. Mm-hmm. He's going to cost the team, I think, in the 30-ish million yeah. dollar range. So you would shed significant salary. They actually have a lot of work to do still, the Padres, because they're losing a lot. I mean, Seth Lugo was a pretty big part of their mm-hmm. pitching staff. Blake Snell was the freaking Cy Young winner. Josh Hader was the best, if not top three, closer in baseball this year. Mm -hmm. I mean, that's just on the pitching side alone. So you look at some of the guys that are locked up long-term for them, Danny, I don't really see many others as trade candidates. You know, a lot of them have no trade clauses and long-term deals. And even ones that are maybe on a little bit of a shorter-term deal don't seem like they're in a great position to be dealt and get much back. So it looks like Soto would be the guy and maybe that's where they'd be able to solve some of the pitching. And then you just assume that the hitting is going to be a little bit better for them this year. And it wasn't bad for them last year. Anyway, it was kind of middle of the pack. So do you think Soto gets dealt? Uh, I think he has to get, get dealt when, when you, you're going to pay a guy and I'm not saying he's not worth it when I make this comment, but you're going to pay a guy in the 30 millions uh, as an arbitration guy before he becomes a free agent and you're on a team that is so lost right now you don't know if you're pl- trying to win if you're trying to like rebuild what are we doing you don't you, you lost your your manager that you signed to a multi-year deal um, there's so many questions with this organization I don't think there's any way that they keep Juan Soto um, you know 30 million dollars for an arbitration guy is a lot of money so go out and trade him to some of these bigger market teams uh, mainly the Yankees. I think the Yankees are the team that's going to go after him, possibly the Mets, because we, we don't know what Cohen is going to do. He likes to spend money, so he could. But uh, I think you got to go out there and try to get whatever you can for him to get uh, to, to rebuild at that major league level. They need some pitching seriously, you know, with, with Tatis and, and Machado there offensively, uh, Bogarts there. It's a ton of money, but they're guys that can pr- uh, provide offense. You need some pitching. And, and you mentioned Hater. Hater's definitely not going back. Blake Snell's definitely not going back, right? At least that's a consensus. Yeah, I don't think so. I mean, if they are indeed trying to cut some money, then you're not going to add two guys that are right. going to make, you know, 20, 30 plus mil a year, depending yeah. on which guy we're talking about here. So I'm with you there. I mean, the other thing is some people mentioning, oh, trade for Soto and then lock him up to a long term extension. Good luck. Okay. Good luck. (laughs) Let me know how that goes. Yeah. If you have a half a billion dollars, go for it. Otherwise you tell me if a player is turned down already, I believe it's 440 and I'll confirm it for you in one sec. Cause I just want to make sure I get the number right uh, this time of year, but the reports for Soto a few years back with the Washington nationals before they traded him July of 2022, 
was that he rejected a 15-year, $440 million offer with no deferred money. And it would have been the largest deal in baseball history. And that was the third offer that they had given him in recent months, like in a short time period. So do you think that, let's say he ends up with the Yanks, for example, Mm -hmm. they're going to throw something at him and it's less than that number and he's going to say yes. Also with Scott Boris as his rep, 0% chance, (laughs) 0% chance he does that. So if you're trading for someone and it's got a five in front of it and you want to, or for Soto and it's got a five in front of it and you want to go down that route, great. But in my mind, most likely, Danny, you have to treat this as a trade for a guy for one season. You're a team that's trying to win next year. And that's why I even think like, it's hard for me to see the Mets when they are trying to build up their farm system. It's been a problem for them for a while now. They made some, uh, in my mind, nice trades when money doesn't matter to, Mm -hmm deal away Verlander and Scherzer and yeah. pick up nice prospects in return from Houston and Texas. Mm-hmm. So if if you don't have that guarantee intact and you're the Mets, are you sacrificing a lot of the future again to pick up someone like Soto? Yanks makes total sense. They mm-hmm. need an offense. That's a perfect fit for them on yeah. many levels. And they don't have to commit to a guy for a billion years like they would for a Cody Bellinger. That's why I think Soto yeah. will be such such a hot commodity and the Padres are going to be pretty tough with teams because they gave up so much to get him, even mm-hmm. though it was, what, a year and a half ago? I still think they're going to get probably like three quarters of what they gave up in terms of prospect value if you tried to put a figure on it. Yeah, you know, like if you're the Yankees, would you consider, I know you mentioned, you know, maybe just get him for the year, but would you consider trading for him and give him an extension Obviously, go way over the 440, but wouldn't you want to do something before Otani signs somewhere? Because he's going to set the standard, obviously, and whatever he gets, Soto's going to ask for what's right behind that. So if you can woo him before Otani signs, you might save you, you know, some commas there in your salary. I, I don't know. I don't know. I don't know. It's it's hard for me to imagine a player that's this close to free agency stopping at this point. You know, he's gotten yeah. so close. And I think if anything, I mean, he could still up his value quite a bit if he has mm-hmm. another big season. Because I think when he first got traded to San Diego, he was down a little. And even in the beginning of last year, he was down and then really picked up the pace. So I think another year of a normal Juan Soto in his prime and then reaching free agency as a baby, like 25, I think is the number that he reaches free agency at, which just never happens, would create kind of a perfect storm of, hey, I'm getting half a billion dollars from a team that really needs it. 